quick. The patient's crashing. Heart rate's 160 and blood pressure is 60 over palp. Grab a vasopressor. Wait, norepinephrine? No, get dobutamine. No, wait, dopamine? Phenylephrine. There's a lot of different vasopressors and there are a lot of types of shock. And it's not always clear which vasopressor we should be using to treat which type of shock. This is a really common question I get in the emergency department where I work. And I've gotten questions from every level of healthcare worker, from 20 year seasoned EM attendings, pharmacists, nurses, technicians, and EM physician residents. Because this is a topic I teach to all of my incoming pharmacy residents, I thought it would be a good idea to make an overview and tutorial video about the different types of shock we see and how we choose vasopressors to complement those types of shock. So this will be an overview for really all comers, anyone who has taken care of a critically ill patient requiring vasopressors. Let's take a look at our objectives on the left. We're gonna define the components of the cardiovascular system. Then we'll review vasopressor pharmacologic effects and how they affect the cardiovascular system. Next, we'll understand the hemodynamic changes that occur in the four different shock subtypes and understand how to choose a vasopressor to complement those hemodynamic changes for that shock. Finally, we'll review the evidence that supports or refutes the use of a vasopressor in a specific shock subtype. So depending on what your learning level is, feel free to jump around this lecture to what you think will be most valuable. So before we talk about how vasopressors work, we have to define the system that they work in. This is just a little diagram of how I think about the cardiovascular system, and it's kind of simple. We have the heart, and we measure the heart's activity in cardiac output, which is in liters per minute, just how much blood do we put out per one minute. The heart pumps blood into the arterial system. And the arterial system is also called cardiac afterload because it is the pressure that the heart has to pump against. The arterial system delivers oxygenated blood to areas that need it. And it moves blood around via vasoconstriction. So the arteries are special because they have smooth muscle in them, which makes them really elastic so they can squeeze and dilate as much as they need. So let's say down here, we have a lot of metabolic activity going on. There's low oxygen and high CO2. That's a signal to the body to vasodilate. And then over here, there's not much going on. I don't really need to send blood there. So the body's gonna vasoconstrict and then the blood will follow the path of least resistance over to the area it needs to go. We can measure the degree of constriction in the arterial system as something called systemic vascular resistance. And you measure this with a special catheter. It's measured in a unit called dynes, which is a unit of force, but that unit is really dependent on how constricted the arteries are overall. So remember, systemic vascular resistance is a measure of arterial constriction. It is not the same as blood pressure, which is commonly confused. And we'll talk about why a little bit later. After the arteries, we go to a capillary bed and then we find our way into the venous system as deoxygenated blood. The venous system is called the cardiac preload, and that's because it's the pressure before the heart or the pressure returning to the heart. We can measure preload a few different ways. One is as central venous pressure and another as pulmonary capillary wedge pressure if you have a special catheter, a pulmonary artery catheter. Uh, in terms of the venous system, the way that fluid moves here is a little bit different than the arterial system. So as we go from the arterial side to the venous side, we lose a little bit of pressure. So let's say we're 32 millimeters of mercury on the arterial side, uh, and then we lose some fluid into the tissue so it can deliver oxygen and nutrients. And then that means we lose hydrostatic pressure. So on the venous side, post-capillary, let's say we're about 20 millimeters of mercury. Well, I need to get that blood back to the right heart. So how do I do that? Unlike the arterial system, I don't have a lot of smooth muscle. There it is. Here's all the smooth muscle in my venous system. Squeezing down on that is not gonna push blood really anywhere. So because I can't actively move the blood, I have to passively move it. And just like any other passive transport system, that means I follow a natural gradient. And in this sense, it's a pressure gradient. So the pressure at the right heart is about six millimeters of mercury, and the pressure uh, post-capillary bed in the venous system is about 20 millimeters of mercury. 
which will mean the blood will flow from here up to the six millimeters of mercury. And there's a special reason why this is drawn like a big trash bag con connected to the heart. That's because most of the blood volume in our circulatory system is actually in the venous system, kind of working its way back up to the heart. I believe something like 70% of the total volume is here. Don't quote me on that. So this system really needs that volume in order to create the pressure gradients that drive fluid back to the heart. And we also have one other special adaptation and that is one-way valves. So as the fluid moves up, it's unable to fall back down because we have these special one-way valves that keep the fluid uh, moving where, uh, in whatever area it is. So once I get past this valve, I won't fall all the way back down to the bottom. Although when these break down, you get varicose veins or uh, blood pooling at the bottom of the venous system. All right, this is kind of a complicated picture, so let's simplify it. You have the heart, which we measure in cardiac output, uh, and that's the amount of blood we pump out per minute. It pumps blood to the arterial system, which is called afterload, and we can measure cardiac afterload uh, in dynes, which is systemic vascular resistance. Usually you need a special catheter to do this. Then we have the venous system, which is cardiac preload, and you can measure the preload in something called central venous pressure. Okay, so now that we know the different components, let's look at some receptors that are important when we're talking about vasopressors and their actions. So the primary receptors we're concerned about on the heart are beta-1 and M1. Beta-1 are adrenergic receptors, adrenergic like adrenaline. Adrenaline, like the thing you release when you're being chased by a bear. And when you're being chased by a bear, you want your heart to beat fast and strong to get oxygen delivered to those running, running muscles that are keeping you away from the bear. So beta-1 receptor stimulation, beta-1 adrenal receptors, are stimulated by catecholamines like epinephrine and norepinephrine, and they lead to increased heart rate and stroke volume. So that's gonna increase my cardiac output because I'm increasing the amount of fluid I'm pumping out with stroke volume and the beats per minute I have with heart rate. M1 receptors are not really important in terms of vasopressors, but uh, they are the, an acetylcholine receptor. And acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter for our parasympathetic nervous system. So when I stimulate muscarinic receptors, it's gonna make the AV node more refractory. And long story short, it just makes the heart beat slower. In fact, if you ever have a patient who's in supraventricular tachycardia and you have them do a vagal maneuver, what that does is stimulate release of acetylcholine onto the M1 and that slows the heart rate down. So M1, parasympathetic, slow heart rate. Beta-1, sympathetic, increase heart rate and stroke volume. Then we have some uh, receptors that are within the vascular system, the arterial specifically, and that's gonna be the alpha-1 and beta-2 receptors. Alpha-1 receptors are pure vasoconstrictors. So they are going to increase my systemic vascular resistance because I'm gonna have more constriction within the arteries. An example of an alpha-1 uh, agonist is phenylephrine. And if you think about it, uh, phenylephrine is actually an over-the-counter decongestant as well. So when your nose is all stuffy, sometimes it's because your vessels are kind of engorged and full of fluid. So you take phenylephrine, it constricts those vessels, and then you can breathe again. Beta-2 receptors are in the arterial system, and they actually decrease your systemic vascular resistance because they are dilators. So anything that stimulates beta-2 will lead to dilation. A really common beta-2 receptor agonist most people know is albuterol, and that's a pulmonary beta-2 agonist, and it leads to dilation of the bronchioles. So even though you're wheezy, you take your albuterol, all of a sudden your bronchioles open up, you can breathe better. But beta-2 stimulation in the arterioles will dilate the arterioles and decrease systemic vascular resistance. Now, there's really no receptors here in the venous system. There's some nitric oxide production, so you can dilate the venous system a little bit, but it's pretty hard to constrict it. So the only way to really modify the venous system is with fluid, because it's that very fluid dependent system that we have. So we know the different components of the cardiovascular system and we know where all of our different uh, receptors work. Now let's look at how they all interact with each other. There are only three equations you need to know 
to understand how different changes in the cardiovascular system will affect each other. The first is that our blood pressure or our mean arterial pressure is our cardiac output times our systemic vascular resistance. Remember, uh, systemic vascular resistance is our degree of arterial constriction, but it is not the only component of blood pressure. As I said before, you can have a high SVR, but if your cardiac output is low, you're not gonna have any blood pressure. So you can be really, really constricted, but if you don't have any output, there's no blood pressure. Now, the body is always going to try to maintain our vital functions via homeostatic mechanisms. Meaning, if one of these changes in one direction, like systemic vascular res resistance decreases, well, then the cardiac output, the body will increase this in order to maintain blood pressure. That's that homeostatic maintenance mechanism. The next equation we need to know is that our cardiac output is equal to stroke volume times heart rate. Remember, cardiac output is measured in liters per minute. So how much volume am I putting out per beat and how many beats do I have per minute? And that gives us our liters per minute. And just like blood pressure, if our heart rate changes, the body might try to increase stroke volume to maintain cardiac output, to maintain blood pressure. Or if my heart rate decreases, uh, or my heart rate increases, it could be because my stroke volume is decreased. Uh, so I'm trying to maintain cardiac output. And the final thing we need to understand is what is stroke volume dependent on? So a very simplified way of thinking about it is that stroke volume is equal to my preload. So it's linearly dependent to preload. And it's kind of inversely dependent to afterload. So the preload is the Frank Starling effect. The more preload we have, the more pressure stretching that ventricle, meaning I'm going to get more of a snap back. So it's kind of like a bungee cord. The more you pull on it, the harder it'll snap back up into a point. And this is demonstrated by the Frank Starling curve here. And eventually that point is pushed and an increase in preload does not give you any additional stroke volume. Uh, and that's kind of when you're in a heart failure scenario. And then we want to think of stroke volume as inversely proportional to afterload because that's the pressure that the ventricle has to push against. So if I have a really high pressure, it's going to be hard to get a lot of fluid out of the ventricle. So if I increase preload, I should increase stroke volume, which will increase cardiac output. And if I increase afterload, I might decrease stroke volume, which could decrease cardiac output. Before we go on, it's important to, to find the drugs that we normally use in shock. So I have listed here our most common catecholamines. These are all drugs that stimulate sympathetic adrenoreceptors. The only difference is the ratio that they hit them in. So some will hit all alpha, some will hit alpha and beta, and some will hit all beta. They all have the same onset, which is rapid. As soon as you start it, you're going to see your effect and a half-life in minutes, meaning when you stop the medicine, it will wear off within minutes. Another drug to talk about is milrinone. This is a little bit different than catecholamines. However, they work about the same way. When catecholamines stimulate a beta-1 adrenoreceptor, it leads to an increase in a molecule called CAMP. That CAMP is what leads to increase in contraction and heart rate and all the things we want from an adrenoreceptor. CAMP is metabolized by a, an enzyme called phosphodiesterase. So milrinone is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, meaning it leads to an increase in CAMP by preventing its breakdown, as opposed to adrenaline or catecholamines, which leads to an increase in CAMP by telling the cell to make more. In chronic heart failure patients, because of the cardiac remodeling and chronic catecholamine stimulation, sometimes they have less beta receptors. So some people think milrinone is a more effective drug in chronic heart failure patients. The most often time you'll see milrinone is in patients who are in severe end-stage heart failure, uh, who are being bridged to transplant or uh, mechanical circulatory support device. You will occasionally see it used in acute shock scenarios though. So I thought it was worth talking about. Now, when we talk about our catecholamines, we classify them based on their effect. So we have our vasopressors, 
Truthfully, a vasopressor is anything that increases our systemic vascular resistance through alpha-1. The only pure vasopressor is phenylephrine. Then we have what I'll call our inopressors. These are things that stimulate alpha-1 and beta-1. So they increase in inotropy and increase in vasoconstriction. That would be drugs like epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And finally, we have our inodilators. These are drugs that increase contractility and heart rate through beta-1 stimulation, but also lead to a decrease in systemic vascular resistance through beta-2 stimulation. And these are going to be drugs like dobutamine, milrinone, which doesn't stimulate beta-2, but it does prevent the breakdown of CGMP, which leads to increased nitric oxide and then vasodilation, and isoproteranol which stimulates beta-1 and beta-2. Now we can look at everything together in terms of our vasopressors and our cardiovascular system. Here's our simple little diagram of the cardiovascular system, and here are our vasopressors listed in degree of most alpha to most beta. This visual representation is probably a little bit easier to look at. So we have things with the most alpha on the left, meaning that they have the most effect on wait a minute, not blood pressure, systemic vascular resistance. And on the right, we have the things with the most beta stimulation, meaning they have the most effect on cardiac output, but if they also have beta-2 stimulation, they're going to have more effect on uh, vasodilation, which could lead to a decrease in systemic vascular resistance. So let's look at each agent. Phenylephrine is a pure alpha agonist, meaning it increases SVR. So that will increase afterload, and without telling the heart to do any more work, we know that that reduces stroke volume, so we might have a decrease in cardiac output from phenylephrine. Norepinephrine, dopamine, and epinephrine are all very similar in that they all hit beta-1, beta-2, and alpha-1. The difference being norepinephrine has a little bit more alpha, than it does beta. So it has a stronger effect on systemic vascular resistance than it does on cardiac output. This is a little bit misleading because it looks like norepi has a negative effect on cardiac output. However, that is not true. It still increases beta-1 and beta-2. So we are going to see uh, with beta-1 increased inotropy and increased chronotropy. The beta-2 and alpha-1 kind of cancel each other out a little bit. And overall, we see an increase in SVR. So we increase our systemic vascular resistance while being able to maintain our cardiac output or increasing it slightly. Dopamine, compared to norepinephrine, has a stronger effect on cardiac output than it does on systemic vascular resistance. So dose for dose, dopamine is going to increase cardiac output more than norepinephrine. Uh, but it might not increase systemic vascular resistance to the same degree. Dopamine's effects are also dose dependent. At lower doses, we see beta stimulation. If you happen to have your ACLS bradycardia cards with you, if you look on what it recommends for drugs to increase heart rate, it says dopamine at a dose of 2 to 10 mics per kilo per minute. And that's because those are the doses where we see beta 1 stimulation. Above 10 mics per kilo per minute, you're going to see more alpha stimulation, in part due to dopamine's direct metabolism to norepinephrine. But it still has less affinity for alpha-1 than norepi does. And then we have epinephrine. So epinephrine has about the same alpha stimulation as norepinephrine does, but a little bit more beta-2. So its effect on systemic vascular resistance is maybe just a pinch lower because we get dilation from beta-2 and constriction from alpha-1. But overall, it also has a stronger affinity for beta-1. So when we look at it on our visual representation, it's going to increase cardiac output more dose for dose than norepinephrine does. There have been many studies that have shown that epi can increase cardiac output more than dopamine, and dopamine increases it more than norepinephrine. However, I like to think of it that norepinephrine will increase your systemic vascular resistance and maintain your cardiac output, and that's how it increases blood pressure, versus dopamine and epinephrine will increase your cardiac output 
but maintain your systemic vascular resistance. And that's how they increase blood pressure. Then we have what we, I would consider our inodilators. So dobutamine, milrinone, and isoproteranol. Dobutamine is primarily beta-1, so the main effect we see is an increase in heart rate and stroke volume. We also get some beta-2, so it can decrease systemic vascular resistance, especially at higher doses. So oftentimes we need to pair dobutamine with another drug that can increase systemic vascular resistance like epi, dopamine, or norepinephrine. Milrinone, like we said before, primarily works through increasing CAMP, but at higher doses, we also get CGMP increase, which leads to nitric oxide and vasodilation. Finally, we have isoproteranol. So this is one you'll probably only ever see uh, in treatment of torsades. It's not routinely used in a lot of shock states, and that's because it will really drop your systemic vascular resistance due to its potency for beta-2. So this one hits beta-1 and beta-2 equally. So great for increasing heart rate, but it also drops your systemic vascular resistance. One more drug I wanted to talk about is vasopressin. This is uh, a natural hormone in our body, and it has uh, effects on vasopressin receptors, which are located in the peripheral vasculature. So it's a pure vasoconstrictor, so you can think about it similar to phenylephrine. I'm talking about it because we often use it as an adjunct for other vasopressors, not as monotherapy. So you'll see this added on in sepsis or vasoplegia, um, and it will increase our systemic vascular resistance. It also has some benefits that our catecholamines do not. At very low pHs, such as people who are in extremes of shock, our catecholamines don't stimulate their receptors very well, but vasopressin still maintains its ability to stimulate the vasopressin receptors, so we can use it at lower pHs. Also, vasopressin might modulate the effect of other vasopressors and make the the receptors more sensitive to catecholamines. So it can increase the effects of your vasopressors and maybe reduce the requirements. And it's often used in sepsis to reduce the requirement of norepinephrine that you need. We definitely talked about a lot. Now let's dive into cardiovascular shock. We're gonna look at the hemodynamic changes that occur in cardiogenic, distributive, hypovolemic, and neurogenic shocks. We'll talk about what causes them and how we might treat them. The first shock we'll talk about is cardiogenic shock. In this scenario, I have a sick heart and something is driving a low cardiac output. This could be due to a low heart rate, such as bradycardia causing cardiogenic shock, or frequently we see low stroke volumes, either from heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or from somebody having a myocardial infarction that's impairing the ejection fraction. So the low heart rate or low stroke volume is driving a decrease in cardiac output. So let's put that on our chart. I'll put a lightning bolt next to the etiology of the shock. We can always reason out what's gonna happen to afterload, preload, or cardiac output based off of the initial thing that changes. So we know our body will try to maintain blood pressure. Cardiac output is down, so the body homeostatically regulates and increases systemic vascular resistance. So let's put an up arrow in our SVR column. Often when you hear people talk about cardiogenic shock, they'll say it's cold and wet or cold and dry. And when they're saying cold, they mean the fingers are cold because I'm so clamped down peripherally due to my increased SVR that I'm not sending a lot of blood flow to the periphery. Uh, when they're talking about Warm versus dry, they're referring to the preload. So generally talking about how much fluid is on the lungs. So we looked at this. I saw an increase in afterload, a decrease in cardiac output, which led to the increase in afterload. But what about preload? Well, the heart is the driving force that is able to get this fluid out of the venous system. And if my output is impaired, that is gonna increase. This is why typically in heart failure and cardiogenic shock, you see jugular venous distension um, and pulmonary edema can often be present as well. When looking at our options for treatment of cardiogenic shock, we might want to choose something that will increase our cardiac output and maybe decrease our systemic vascular resistance.
That would leave us with options like dobutamine, isoproteranol, milrinone. However, decreasing systemic vascular resistance in the setting of an already low blood pressure may reduce our blood pressure even further. Afterload reduction therapy is a mainstay of heart failure treatment, and sometimes it can actually lead to an increase in blood pressure in chronic heart failure patients, such as people who are started on an ACE inhibitor. If their afterload reduces enough that it significantly increases their stroke volume, it can actually increase cardiac output to the point that their blood pressure is increased. But in acute shock with low blood pressure, you usually don't want to worsen your blood pressure by possibly decreasing afterload. So while dobutamine makes sense in theory, we might need something that's going to maintain our afterload, leaving us with epi, dopamine, and norepinephrine. We know from trials of sepsis that dopamine will increase our cardiac index more so than norepinephrine for the same MAP. However, that also means that it increases the cardiac oxygen demand with dopamine compared to norepinephrine. In a very large trial of norepinephrine versus dopamine, a sub-analysis of the cardiogenic shock group found that there was a higher 28-day mortality with dopamine. And overall, there was more arrhythmia with dopamine compared to norepinephrine. And this was also supported by a large meta-analysis of both English and Chinese language trials that found that there was a higher incidence of mortality and arrhythmia with dopamine compared to norepinephrine. So while it makes sense in theory, the data seems to show that it might not be the best in terms of patient outcomes. Epinephrine is also a reasonable option given that it has strong beta-1 receptor effects and it actually increases cardiac output more than dopamine or norepinephrine for the same MAP. And while it does that, it also maintains our systemic vascular resistance. However, newer data is starting to show that it might not have the best patient outcomes. One small trial of patients in cardiogenic shock after percutaneous coronary intervention, so patients with ischemia-related cardiogenic shock, found that epi-treated patients were more likely to have refractory shock, and they also found a non-statistically significant increase in seven-day mortality with epinephrine versus norepinephrine. And if you looked at a composite outcome of mortality or need for extracorporeal life support, epinephrine had statistically significantly higher rates than norepinephrine. Additionally, some larger meta-analysis also support that epinephrine in cardiogenic shock may have a higher association with mortality than other vasopressors. While it's not necessarily clear why there was an increase in refractory shock, mortality, or extracorporeal life support in that small trial comparing epi versus norepi, one marker of cardiac oxygen demand was elevated, called a cardiac double product, in the epinephrine versus the norepinephrine group, pointing towards possibly a higher increase in oxygen demand with epi compared to norepi, which can be tough on an already stressed heart. We didn't talk about phenylephrine at all. And that's because it probably would not complement this state of shock. As afterload is already increased, causing an unopposed increase in afterload by stimulation of my alpha receptor might actually worsen stroke volume, which would lead to a further reduction in cardiac output and possibly worse cardiogenic shock. So while epinephrine and dopamine make sense in theory as single agents for cardiogenic shock, the data supports possible increased cardiac oxygen demand, increased mortality, and increased arrhythmia. So because of that, the American Heart Association has recommended norepinephrine as the possible first-line agent for cardiogenic shock. Uh, it does increase cardiac index. It does increase systemic vascular resistance more than cardiac output, but it allows cardiac output to, maintain, to, to be maintained in the setting of an increased SVR. So often what we will do start patients on norepinephrine and then add on uh, to maintain a adequate blood pressure and then add dobutamine for increased inotropy and possible afterload reduction. The next shock is distributive shock. These are usually shocks caused by inflammation 
And if you remember, inflammation is designed to make the blood vessels leaky so that the immune system can jump in them and use the body's natural highway to go find that foreign body and attack it. But with leaky blood vessels, we lose fluid. So fluid leaks out into the interstitial space or the third space, and we no longer have that volume in our circulatory system. Despite losing volume in both the afterload and preload system, remember that the preload system is the most sensitive to pressure changes. So we see a decrease in preload, which leads to a decrease in stroke volume. And because our stroke volume is reduced, we're gonna see a increase in heart rate in order to maintain our cardiac output. That's why your anaphylactic patients are often tachycardic. Uh, one of the SERS criteria of sepsis is tachycardia, right? However, when we're dilating the arterial system due to increased histamine release from inflammation, we actually see a reduced afterload as well. And when afterload is reduced, but stroke volume is dependent on afterload and preload, well, if both preload and afterload are reduced, there might actually be no change in stroke volume. So if I have a normal stroke volume, but an increased heart rate, I can actually see an increase in, in cardiac output. So in sepsis, we sometimes refer to this as a hyperdynamic shock because they usually have an increased cardiac output. And even in early sepsis, you could sometimes see an increase in blood pressure. So they can be hypertensive in very early sepsis due to this increased cardiac output. When treating septic shock, we need to treat the etiology of the shock. The first thing we see affected due to the relative hypovolemia is our preload. And the only way to affect that is volume expansion. So the first intervention you often see in septic shock is 30 mils per kilo of fluid resuscitation. Now, whether that is too much fluid or not is a whole topic of debate right now, but they do need some volume expansion for the relative hypovolemia. If they remain hypotensive after fixing preload, then we need to address the afterload. And with that, we'll choose a vasopressor, which can increase our systemic vascular resistance. Knowing that our cardiac output is already high or possibly unchanged, an ideal presser might be one that has only alpha effects. So phenylephrine has been compared to norepinephrine in very small studies, and they found no difference in short-term cardiopulmonary performance or global oxygen transport. Uh, or any meaningful outcomes, but there is vastly more data for the use of norepinephrine in septic shock. So dopamine and epinephrine are ELSO agents that can increase our afterload, but they have a little bit more effect on cardiac output. Dopamine has been compared to norepinephrine in a few different trials, and they found that small trials showed there was more refractory shock with dopamine than norepinephrine, and larger trials have shown more arrhythmogenicity uh, in trials of septic shock patients. When compared to epinephrine, there's really no difference between norepi and epi in terms of mortality or abil ability to maintain the MAP goal. However, epi has a unique side effect. It causes the body to increase lactic acid production. Now, lactic acid is one of the labs we use to measure how well our resuscitation is going. So in epi-resuscitated patients, they'll have a higher lactic acid and possibly a lower pH, making it confusing as to whether or not the patient is demonstrating these signs due to poor resuscitation or from the drug itself. So for these reasons, as well as a few other small trials, norepinephrine is the first line vasopressor for septic shock. If norepinephrine by itself doesn't work, they recommend adding vasopressin or epinephrine to norepinephrine. Remember, we talked about vasopressin, that is a vasopressin receptor agonist, and it leads to a pure increase in afterload. It also is able to work at lower pHs and modulate norepinephrine's response to the receptor, making it more potent. So you can use vasopressin to reduce your norepinephrine requirements, and this is often a go-to for many clinicians. Uh, epinephrine is also a good second line agent that you can add, especially if there's concern that the cardiac output isn't perfect. Um, and if that has failed, you can also consider adding dobutamine to patients who have failed uh, initial vasopressor agents. So even though you know 
these nice little graphs all make sense in theory. Uh, patients can exist in different, uh, even with multiple shock states going on, such as a patient with chronic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction who has septic shock, and they might need some dobutamine support to also increase their cardiac output. Finally, I'll just touch on this here. The surviving sepsis campaigns also say you can use dopamine as an alternative to a vasopressor agent like norepinephrine in highly selected patients who have a low risk of tachyarrhythmia and are in an absolute or relative bradycardia. So they're basically saying, look, dopamine might increase your heart rate more, but it's more arrhythmogenic. If you have someone who's bradycardic and septic, you can consider it, but overall, there's probably better options. Next up is hypovolemic shock. These are patients who have lost fluid, either through dehydration or blood loss. If you remember, the venous system is the most sensitive to the fluid changes within our cardiovascular system. So the first thing we'll see is a decrease in preload. And with that decrease in preload, we're gonna get a decrease in stroke volume. The body might compensate by becoming tachycardic to maintain the cardiac output, but generally overall cardiac output is down. And because cardiac output is down, that leads our body to try to maintain blood pressure by increasing systemic vascular resistance. So these patients may be clamped down. Treatment of hypovolemic shock is directed at correcting preload. None of our vasopressors correct preload, so the treatment is fluid or blood. You could argue you could use dobutamine to increase cardiac output and reduce afterload, but those are compensatory effects that we need in order to maintain our blood pressure in this patient who has severely reduced preload. So that wouldn't be very helpful. There is some data looking at use of vasopressors in early traumatic hemorrhage. Uh, it's somewhat conflicting, but either way, vasopressors are not a routine part of traumatic hemorrhage resuscitation right now. It is blood uh, or blood product, and for uh, hypovolemic due to dehydration, it is fluid. The final type of shock we might see is neurogenic shock, where an injury to the brain or spinal cord inhibits our ability to send sympathetic signals to the rest of the body. We lose our beta-1 and alpha-1 adrenoreceptor stimulation, and that leads to a decrease in cardiac output and cardiac afterload. The preload is not generally affected because there aren't many receptors in the venous system that we're even sending signals to. Now, we also lose our homeostatic feedback mechanisms. So normally, uh, if I have a decrease in uh, stroke volume, I'll see a decrease in cardiac output and my body will try to increase heart rate. But because I can't send any sympathetic signals, heart rate is also down. Uh, blood pressure, even though my afterload is reduced, my cardiac output can't compensate, so I'm down on all areas and we end up with a low blood pressure. When thinking about which vasopressor we want to use, we want to choose one that complements the hemodynamic deficits that we have. So ideally, we want something with both alpha and beta activity, since both of those are no longer innervated. However, we don't always see cardiac output decreased. Uh, this is more typical in spinal cord injuries greater than the thoracic six vertebrae. When this is injured, we usually have unopposed parasympathetic tone being uh, sent to the heart. So we can't send sympathetic signals, but we can still send the parasympathetic signals. Remember when we talked about the M1 muscarinic receptor? Well, in T6 or higher injuries, it tends to be all acetylcholine sprinkling on that M1 receptor, and we see cardiac output decreasing. Uh, if it's T6 or lower, we might have a normal heart rate uh, or even be tachycardic due to our low SVR. So when treating neurogenic shock, the guidelines recommend that you match your vasopressor based on the site of the injury. If it's above T6 and the patient is bradycardic, well, you should avoid using something that's pure alpha agonist like phenylephrine because you might worsen the bradycardia and you won't provide any beta innervation. If it's a below T6 injury and the patient's tachycardic or normal cardiac, uh, you could consider phenylephrine uh, because they probably have beta innervation, they're only lacking adrenal or alpha adrenal innervation. So giving them a pure alpha agonist is okay. There is not really consensus on what the best vasopressor is for neurogenic shock. There are some small trials, not really worth talking about, but they do find 
higher rates of complication when using dopamine or phenylephrine compared to very small numbers of norepi or epi. Uh, and some trials have shown higher rates of arrhythmia with dopamine compared to phenylephrine in older adults. That said, the data is not very convincing. Look at your patient. If their heart rate is low, choose something that has beta receptor stimulation. And if their heart rate is high, you can consider using just phenylephrine. There you have it. Now you know how the cardiovascular system regulates itself. You understand how those regulations change and the different types of shock that can occur. And you know the different effects of your vasopressors and how they can complement the types of shock that you see. For anyone who had to take a little nap during any of this, I'll do a quick summary. Choose an intervention to treat the etiology of your shock. Try to avoid selecting an agent that could make things worse, like phenylephrine and cardiogenic shock or somebody with a bradycardia, or even introducing something with significant beta agonism in somebody who's tachycardic or in an arrhythmia. Then follow the evidence. We summarized the available guidelines and a lot of the relevant literature, though it wasn't all inclusive. In the data we did look at, we found for cardiogenic shock, the AHA recommends norepinephrine as a first-line agent, driven primarily by its lower rates of arrhythmogenicity, but the jury's not necessarily out. We found that epi and dopamine both increase cardiac index more than norepinephrine, but that probably comes at the cost of an increased cardiac oxygen demand, which might be tough in an already stressed heart. We know dopamine has higher rates of mortality and arrhythmia in cardiogenic shock compared to norepinephrine and higher rates of arrhythmia in all types of shock. Epinephrine compared to norepinephrine in a small trial of ischemic cardiogenic shock had higher rates of refractory shock, mortality, and need for extracorporeal life support. A combination of norepinephrine plus dobutamine as needed to support cardio cardiac output might allow us to maintain blood pressure without putting as much strain on our stressed heart. In distributive shocks, specifically sepsis, the surviving sepsis guidelines recommend norepinephrine as a first-line agent. Then you can add on vasopressin or epinephrine as a second-line agent, and if that fails, throw on some dobutamine. We also saw that dopamine, once again, uh, has higher rates of arrhythmia than norepinephrine. This is really just for all shocks, and that's really specifically seen with AFib in many trials. And it has higher rates of refractory shock in certain trials. Norepinephrine is probably equal to epinephrine in terms of its efficacy for maintaining MAP in distributive shocks, but it has less of an effect on metabolic parameters like lactic acid, so it doesn't confound our resuscitation as much. For hypovolemic shock, put down the vasopressor because you need blood products or fluid. And for neurogenic shock, you can choose whichever vasopressor you think will best complement their hemodynamic profile. Just make sure you look at their heart rate first. And if we kind of look at everything overall, a combination of norepinephrine and dobutamine seems to work for most types of shock. That is all that I have for you. I will leave the references for any guidelines or studies that I cited in the description below so you can read them and draw your own conclusions. If you have questions or comments, feel free to leave a comment here or reach out to me on Twitter at EMPoisonPharmD. Yes, I know that's a cheesy name that sounds like an 80s metal band, but it's what I have. I'll also have a link in the description where you can go to another video and use the principles you learned here about the cardiovascular system and apply them to how post-intubation hypotension occurs if that's something that interests you. I only really made this video because I'm a bit of a nerd and I like to share educational videos with the residents that are on rotation with me in the emergency department. But I do plan to make a few more videos regarding a variety of topics related to emergency medicine and toxicology. So feel free to stop back at this channel to see if there's any updates. I hope you enjoyed the video and thanks for watching.